see him. I see you on a restream. Let me make sure that you're on Facebook and YouTube. Well, I just got an alert that I'm on Facebook. Yep, it's working. Should I stop it and restream? No, it's okay. Hi, everybody. We're here really early. Should I start stop it and restart it? I could. Wait, I want to see if the chat, oh, the chat works too. Everything working? Chat. Really excited. It's so excited. And there are people watching us right now. Hang on, I want to see if I type in here if it actually goes to both places. Okay. Hi, people. See, I knew that being on 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 Facebook and YouTube is the key. Everybody, you're seeing the behind the scenes of us testing our new technology. Um, we finally got restream. Yes, see, there's five okay, people. I on. just see Allison. Yeah, people are on there. Can you I, see if I respond or does that work? Hi, Allison. <laughs> Everybody, this is Rabbi Technical Director Adam Lutz in the background, making sure we're doing this right. Um, and Lauren Croft. Lauren, you can, if you want to like end your video for a minute, I mean, you know, you could come back in three minutes if you want. Okay, I will take that break and grab some water. Yeah, it's true. So I can respond to her on Facebook. Now the question is, does that come through on YouTube also? Um, Where is the video? Ugh, let's see if you got... It's not easy. Here we go. <laughs> I know, YouTube okay. is... So, so here's what's interesting. Um, if people are chatting on Facebook, yes, I, yeah, it's not going through to YouTube, but my responses go to both places. So I think what we would have to do is like we were embedding the chat before, um, we could embed this integrated chat into the stream. Hi everyone, we'll be live um, in five minutes. We're just testing our restreaming um, capabilities because um, we want to be able to get to people on YouTube and Facebook. So we are here. Go ahead and say hi, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. Um, but I just want to let you know you're in the right place and we're really excited for this conversation today. Yeah, so yeah. I Chat. Hi, everybody. We'll be with you in two minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Right in if you're here. Um, I told Lauren to come back in a minute. Oh, there she is. Um, there's like a shiny okay. light on my head. Hi, everybody. Right in if you're Oops, here. I turn off my sound. Um, I told Lauren to come back in a minute. Oh, there she is. Oh, 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 oh um, there's like a shiny okay. light on my head. Hi, everybody. <laughs> right in if you're here. Um, I turn off my sound. Um, I told Ooh, okay. There we go. So people will start to come on, I am sure. I have literally three windows open. Love this technology. But Lauren, I'm gonna focus on you on Zoom and not worry about anything else. Sounds good. That sound good? All right, you can hear me okay? 
can hear you um, great. I am going to open YouTube and that way anyone who's on there will be able to chat. Apparently there is some way for us to um, uh, like to see the chat all in one place, but I haven't quite figured that out yet. <laughs> um, all right, YouTube testing live. I actually didn't get an email about this one. All right, um, Lauren, how's the weather in uh, wherever you are? <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm in New York and the weather, actually we've had a pretty mild summer, so that's really nice. Um, because it can be humid and we're just trying to enjoy, I have some outdoor space, which is very rare. I know it's very common in LA, but it's very rare. You don't rare have a lot York. of inside space, but you have a lot, <laughs> you have more outside. No space, space. period, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me turn off this heavy light that's on my head. <laughs> is it one of those circles? No, it's not okay. actually. It's, uh, this is just better, I think. It's my, my chandelier above my table, but I think this is better and turn up the, there we go, much better. Kind of looks like I have bookcases behind me, but there's a yes. mirror behind me or not. Huh. Um, we're going to give people, so typically on Think About Thursdays, it takes people 10 minutes to get in here. Great. So, we'll so just we chat. can't wait our precious discussion. We have to, we have to, uh, we have to, you know, be very, careful. No. <laughs> I feel like I'm um, on a podcast, which I kind of like. It's like, yes, never... that's kind of the style of this. Jay, good morning, Jay. Um, also, unlike Facebook, where you can see as people log in, which I'm about to do, um, with YouTube, you know, you, you can be just like a looky-loo. You only appear on the screen if um, you talk, <laughs> uh, oh. which is a benefit. You, you know, we've had funny things like different clergy or different people who like will, will come on to our services and it's like, hello, Rabbi, whatever. And it's like, maybe they don't want to be... <laughs> <laughs> maybe they just want to like pop in and yeah maybe they just yeah. want to be a looky-loo to see what awesome stuff we're doing <laughs> um okay there we go now i can see let's see can, it looks like adam might be rabbi lutz might be moderating for us i see um thank you ali's on my sister and i see sis good morning sis and i see marta and i see karen i see marge Good morning, Mark. We, we got a quorum. This is great. We, we do. We officially, our words will not be wasted. <laughs> there we go. I'm, I'm just wondering for those of you on YouTube, I did a test a little bit ago and I got an alert, like an email alert. I did not for some reason get one for the one that's happening right now. So if you can let me know if you got an email alert that we went live, that would just be great for me to know. Um, before we start with Lauren in about five minutes, it's gonna take a little, a little more time. Um, um, Lauren, where have you been finding your Zoom backgrounds? <laughs> so yes, I, I love Zoom backgrounds. This is I a know, Zoom right? background. It is fake. <laughs> um, and I had, so I started um, doing the Ravenclaw common room, but am no longer. This was this was pre some really disappointing news about JK Rowling. Right. Um, and so I needed to find inspiration. So I just started to Google beautiful gallery walls and have found so many just straight up Googling that. And so this yeah. is one of my- I know I um, typed in, like I even went to Adobe Photostock. You can get, they, they literally make them now for- you know, Oh, they totally know. do. I liked, I liked the chic, uh, like I think this is what I'd want my living yeah. room to look like if I could. Exactly. Um, not that it's that complicated, but it's, there's very pretty books back there. I love it. I, I mean, I haven't looked at what the content of them are. I don't know that I could see it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, okay, let's give it three minutes. And then we are going to start um, again. Welcome, everyone. We are, for the first time, using Restream. So you'll see this little Restream bot. It looks like on our, oh, I see Barry Brucker. Um, uh, I see this Restream bot, which allows us to go from Zoom to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. Um, and this is actually the first time we've used it. We're um, so, oh good, Karen, I start at 9.59, awesome. You got a Facebook alert. Oh no, but what about YouTube? I'm, what I'm wondering if people who get YouTube alerts, like for our services and stuff, did you get an alert about this? Um, okay, 
So um, I'm just wondering about that. There's a lot more people. Um, can you record this? I'm taking a destination. I think, um, Rabbi Lutz, if you are watching, which I think you are, because I think you are Restream Bot <laughs> on YouTube, um, maybe you can rename yourself. Uh, hi, Rabbi Laura Geller. Good morning. We're so happy that you're here. Good morning. Oh. Um, and we're going to, I think, have a really interesting um, conversation. Um, today, you know, Lauren... I really want to wait two more minutes. I'm going to wait two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could talk about us. Should we talk about yeah. how we know so each other? I met Lauren when she was five years old. Right? Were you born? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. five and eight, right? Five and like, yeah. Like oh, a little, and no, a no, no. Five and nine. Five, five and nine. nine. Okay. Um, and uh, so we met when after the 1994 earthquake, which I've discussed on here, was a major pivotal event in the Weiss family's lives. So um, after our, the foundation of our house cracked and my dad had been um, commuting from Tarzana to Century City, we finally moved. My, my dad said, where are we going to put triplets? into high school and school and the Beverly Hills schools were good. So we moved to Beverly Hills. And the very first family that Susie Wallach, who still works at, at the school, she's now the administrative uh, director person at the middle school. Um, anyways, she was at El Rodeo. And my mom came in and said, I have these triplets and I don't know who to talk to. And of course, Susie Wallach sent us to Lauren's mom. And the rest is history to the point that we lived together. Yes, we did. All five Weisses, a dog with all the Bruckers. Sorry. Uh, for how long? Like it was like six weeks. It was it was supposed to be. Um, <laughs> um, it was supposed to be like a week. And I'll never forget like saying to my fourth or fifth grade teacher, like, I'm not really going to be able to do homework because we're going to be living with our friends and I'm, it's going to be hard to focus, which if you know me, like I would never use excuses for work. So it was just like a, so looking back on it, like why I even thought to say that was ridiculous. Well, I was lucky because I had all these amazing older siblings that I got to look up to. So yeah. And like, and by the way, she, Lauren got treated very well because she had to share her room with me and Sarah <laughs> and she was a very precocious kindergartner. <laughs> at the time <laughs> or she was going into first grade when we first met and um our families have just like have a unconditional love for each other and um our relationships personally have grown over the years and i think you know there's people you come to in life that you have a great mutual respect for and i mean i know i definitely respect lauren and the work that she is doing and to see you know the path that is. you've taken from, you know, high school to college to becoming a lawyer to working at ADL is just amazing. And it's it's just amazing to see how life turns out. Like you just, you, I don't know that you would have ever known. Actually, I know if you would ask 16 year old Lauren, will you be a lawyer? Yeah, maybe that, that yes. I was going to say, would you work for a Jewish uh, nonprofit? I think you would have said no. Then again, you were like in the throes of going to Camp Newman. So like, of course, it would have made sense. Right. Um, so yeah. So introduce yourselves. Oh, I should also say that, um, of course, through the Temple Emanuel community, um, we they had actually left for a bit. We brought them back. We're like, please be with here with us. And the rest is history. And now both um, parents have been presidents and... Um, it's just an important, very, they're very integral to the Temple Emanuel community. So that's my introduction of Lauren. What would you like to say? Thank <laughs> you. Before well, you start talking too, I just yeah. want to see if we're missing any. I see lots of good mornings. Um, I just want to, you know, um, as we, <laughs> Rabbi Geller, you are on, I think you're on both platforms. Anyways, we're really happy to have you here. All right. Lauren nice. Croft. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm really excited to just get talking. I love, I love our conversations, Lizzie. We've, we've grown up together and I grew up in the Temple Emanuel community, which means so much to me. Um, and I would, in introducing myself, maybe I'll just skip ahead to now yeah. who I am and what I'm doing. Cause 
Um, what do you mean we, we can't talk about you as like a five-year-old? I know, right? I was going to say, I think we, we covered it decently, though. There's definitely more stories there. For sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I am a civil rights attorney. I work at the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL. And I work there because of uh, being a practicing attorney in Los Angeles and doing the Glass Leadership Program with you which we did together as glass Which was a classmates. coincidence, by the oh, way. Didn't know. Yeah. We didn't know until like we showed up and both of us were in the glass class. Actually, will you tell people what that, what that was? I will. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. tell that after to give context. But yeah, so I work for the Anti-Defamation League. I am the National Policy Council and I sit on the civil rights team and have a portfolio that covers our broader civil rights issues and then zooms in on our work in the technology sector and also our work regarding free speech on college and university campuses. But in this time, you know, the thing about being in a, in a civil rights organization and being in a, an organization that's really serving the community needs, I'm really focusing on the civil rights and, and racial justice work that we're doing. Um, I'm obviously focusing on the technology uh, work that I've already been building on and how that's impacting our lives in light of, um, you know, just the general trend towards digital and, and tech in life. And then of course being catapulted um, from the coronavirus pandemic. And so, so that also to our election work, um, making sure that we have free and fair and safe elections. And so lots of things swirling, um, but ADL is a 107 year old organization. It's, it's a sort of a household name, but I'll just give the quick quick bites for it it's well um, I do have to say we think it's a household you know organization I you know even growing up in L growing up in LA I wish I had known more about the anti-defamation league so I just want I'm trying to yeah. bring more notice to it even at Temple Emanuel but yeah Absolutely. let's let's hear a little bit of the the formation of ADL and like you know you said it's 100 years old more than 100 now right 112 100 and it was uh, 1913 1907 yeah exactly yeah. So, yeah. So ADL has a dual mission. They've had a mission, uh, that same mission since 1913. It's to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Um, and that mission uh, has endured. Sorry, getting a little feedback. Um, and, yeah, no, sorry. There you no, go. You're good. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Has endured from 1913 and the, the, the point or purpose of the dual mission is you can't fight one form of hate without fighting all forms of hate. Um, and so that's ADL in a nutshell. It has um, 25 regional offices across the country. It has national programs. We do work um, you know, all across the, the civil rights sector. We also have a, a really robust education team. We track anti-Semitism and extremism and those trends and have analysts doing that. So it's it's a dynamic organization. Uh, and I got involved the same way you did, which was through the Glass Leadership Program, which is a program that met most of the regional offices have for um, next gen leaders to learn about the organization and to learn about their own activism and how to be um, how to be a change maker in the spaces that are meaningful to you. Do you remember how, because I have some thoughts about this, like how you came upon the Glass class? I do, yeah. I um, I was practicing law um, at a civil litigation firm and doing a lot of work around Section 1983 cases, which are the civil side to civil rights cases, um, and really just grappling with. And I was doing it on the defense side, so representing our institutions, uh, which we'll probably touch upon it later in the conversation too. And <laughs> grappling with what that means uh, and wanting to put that into greater context, knowing that I've always been drawn to the, the civil rights and justice space. Um, and like, what is, what, is, what is justice and what does that mean? Um, and so I had an attorney that I looked up to who worked for ADL and she just sort of brought me in like, hey, come to the legal advisory committee breakfast, learn about this program we're putting on. And then she said, I really think you should apply for this program. Um, it, her, the attorney is one of my mentors. Her name is Michelle Deutschman. She now runs the um, free speech and civic engagement uh, program for the University of California at large. Their headquarters are at UCI, but it's for all of the UCs. And Ooh, so- UCI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And so, Unfortunately, and UCI probably needed it most too. So yeah, so that's how that's how I got involved. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting as clergy. One thing that I remember really grappling with was we we kind of it's I call it choose your own adventure, and I really mean that with the most love. Like, not only choose your own. Um, you know, projects that you want to work on. If you're lucky enough to work in an institution like I do, where I have the freedom, but also like as you develop yourself, as one develops oneself as a leader, what are the foundations and associations that you want to attach your name to? And, um, you know, I, I, it was very difficult for me for good and for bad. I'm a very empathetic person. So it's hard for me to say, to get up in front of people and say, no, I completely disagree, or yes, I completely agree, because I can see both sides of every situation. And so in that way, I consider myself moderate, that I'm not going to just label myself one way or the other. It's just things are not so black and white to me. And for me, ADL, with the mission of fighting all bigotry, was I could align with that no matter what. Because no, I've, there is proof that ADL has supported things that you wouldn't have thought it would support. And it also has the reputation of, oh, they're too left. Oh, they're too right. Oh, too. And I like that because it means that you're looking at specific issues and making decisions based on how people are treated and how people are spoken about. Um, and that was really important. And so I think I can't even remember how how I got the, the application, but um, it was amazing. I have to say through ADL, I then, um, this is actually just, um, just something I just realized. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Germany with 10 clergy from the West Coast. And that was after the, um, um, <laughs> the Los Angeles, uh, what's it called? The General Consul of Germany, um, called ADL saying, we need a few rabbis. Do you have anyone to recommend? And they said, we have a cantor to recommend. Not only was I just so honored that they recommended me, I was also the only woman at the time. And then I called, when I met, met with them and said, I think you should have, it shouldn't just be me with eight men. That's going to not look good. And we got three more women on the trip and it was a trip of a lifetime. And I really can't say thank you enough to Amanda Suskin and everyone at ADL at the time who um, who did that. So um, I just, one thing I wanna go back to because you said that part of your portfolio is kind of all the online stuff. So yeah. tell us a little bit more about that because I remember when we did glass class, they were really just starting their okay. um, division uh, regarding all that. So give, give me a little sense of that. Definitely. So yeah. that, uh, that's right. Cause the timing, I think we did glass. If I, I remember this, it was 2015 to 16 because we ended up going to DC right before the election. So that's that was, right. Um, yeah. oof, what a time. So yeah. in 2017, you know, and, and ADL has a long standing cognizance of the way that technology and social media more specifically intersect with our lives and with hate uh, and hate online. And so for decades, ADL had been um, talking with and having relationships with, relationships with technology companies, did a working group for their uh, hate and hate speech policies. Um, and so ADL has always had that in mind, but then in 2017, they launched our Center for Technology and Society, which we call CTS. It's headquartered in Silicon Valley, um, and but has employees, full-time staff all over the country. And the mission of CTS is how do we secure justice and fair treatment to all in digital environments? And so, you know, it's only been a couple of years and we've really tried to figure out what is ADL's unique position to be able to you know, lead in the space, be able to contribute to the space because the intersection of technology and civil rights uh, and the intersection of technology and anti-hate is, um, is really broad, but also kind of a confusing and new space. And so it's, I, it's, I've said this before in, in talking about this, but it's sort of considering those centuries old questions in new ways. And so for me, the work that I've been doing around that, because again, tech is so broad and the way that it impacts our civil rights has everything from you know, algorithm bias to privacy to online hate and harassment and everything in between. It's such a continuum. 
can you, been- can you, sorry, just, just explain algorithm bias. I know what that is as a tech yeah. person, but no yeah. problem. Yeah. So privacy is, is a little bit, even though it's also broad, it's a little bit clearer of a term, you know, what are our privacy rights in digital spaces and how is, you know, how's our behavior activity being surveilled in any way or censored or, you know, what is anonymity, all those open questions. Algorithm bias is in machine learning and in building tech tools. One shortcut that's been an amazing innovation for the tech sector is the use of algorithms. So these shortcuts that we can build, um, build synapses based on data sets, all that to say it's the, it's the black box that sort of pops something out in a search engine or pops or pops out your credit score. It's, it's what, how do we take in the data and the information and then pop something out? Well, any machine learns from the people that build it and from the data that is input. And this is like a really, you know, all, all my tech friends will be like, Lauren, you said that wrong, but at, at a basic level. Yeah. Um, and so our biases, because everybody has bias, are inserted into we building. Do? We do, I know. Maybe we'll talk about that in a little maybe bit. We, maybe we maybe could. We, <laughs> we all have bias. We have more than bias, in fact, but we certainly all have bias. Um, and so that is inserted into everything we build. And it's also inserted by the data that we use to build our machines. And so algorithm bias basically, unsurprisingly, disproportionately impacts people from marginalized communities because our builders are oftentimes based on our systems, which we can talk about later, non-marginalized individuals, generally homogenous individuals, um, mostly white men. Um, and so, so it's just how in orientation are our inherent biases um, actually impacting people based on credit scores, insurance reports, all the tech we use. So, so that's algorithm just, uh, bias. In, in layman's terms, um, just, I'm gonna try, cause I'm gonna try and see if, tell me if I have this right, okay? Yeah which is the people that are creating the algorithms are often privileged, come from certain backgrounds often, right? And they are using the data of the websites you've been to, your credit score, the car you bought, the conversations you're having online, <laughs> who knows, um, to target you to um, affect the advertisements that are showing up on your Facebook or the emails that you're getting? Is that kind of what we're, what we're getting at? Um, sort of all. I'll say one more thing and then okay. we'll, we'll move on from, okay. it's, oh, we could go so deep on that. And we, um, but I will say if I'm building something for myself, if I'm making a meal for myself, let's put it that way. I'm right. going to make a meal that sounds good to me. I'm going to make a meal based on the way that my fridge looked f- six years ago, a year ago last month. And that's how I know I'm going to make a meal. But when I make a meal for everybody in the entire country, I'm probably, the meal might not consider somebody with different eating habits, somebody with certain religious or dietary restrictions, somebody who, you know, comes from a different culture than me and has different food. So if you think about if I'm building a tool and that tool is being used by everybody, it might not work so well for somebody who's not in the room building it. I don't I know if that's, but that's yeah, out. yeah, I do. And, and, you know, I do have to say the first thing that came to mind was, um, the Trump election. <laughs> I probably shouldn't call it the Trump election, but it was the 2016 election with the, all the research that's been done of how people were targeted. So I was going more that way because that, that is ba- that was also based on algorithms and yes. t- extreme targeting and, um, cool. um, things like that. Uh, she, your mother yes she likes the the fridge anthology okay uh, right. not so, anthology, but I'll, I'll get to the last one real quick about technology because i've actually been doing most of my work in the online hate and harassment space so i'll just quickly touch on that and then we can move to other questions. and also but, eventually yeah. like um my, one of our beloved congregants robert bird said that is why i am not a member of facebook so that will be <laughs> like another interesting to talk oh, for to sure we can talk about, about that um, absolutely how, how we basically like put out our, yeah, our thoughts Absolutely. through social media. Yeah. Totally. A tool okay. and a sword. But yeah, so online hate and harassment is really the other space and, and victims and targets of online harassment because that's the, the other piece as an organization that has 25 regional offices. We get, we, we're deep roots in, in communities across the country and we noticed a trend that a lot more people were talking about online harassment. 
and being harassed in some way online. And that's an umbrella term for online harassment. And it can go from speech that's fully, it, it wouldn't be protected on platforms because they're private companies, but let's just say like speech that generally would be maybe protected in some setting to crimes online. And so a lot of the work I've been doing is trying to create a better understanding that our online space, just because something happens online, doesn't mean we can't do anything about it to protect victims and targets. To better understand that online harassment does disproportionately impact people when they're harassed based in some part, not in whole, on their identity, whether it's their religion, their gender, their sexual orientation, their you know, you name it, but some sort of protected characteristic, that is the data that we have. People are disproportionately impacted when they're part of a marginalized community or in some part because of their identity. So that makes it an ADL issue. So that's a lot of the work I've been doing on what are the laws on the books around online harassment? What's the awareness out there? What are the gaps? You know, what's going on on college campuses with that? Um, how can we teach people about online hate and harassment? Yeah, and why, uh, I think a lot of people don't understand that ADL was even was at the forefront of creating the legislation for hate crimes. Yes. I mean, that is the most amazing thing to think of in the, in the, in the first place. And um, I, it'd be interesting, do you know if there's this, think about it Thursdays, if there's a, um, I, I, we have not discussed this. So if you don't know, it's fine to say, I don't know. Do you know if there's like a percentage of, if you look at the crimes in the United States, what percentage of crimes um, ultimately are hate crimes? So we have lots of data on hate crimes. I'm so glad you asked, even though <laughs> we didn't talk about this, but yeah. um, the Hate Crime Statistic Act requires all, requires bureaus to report um, hate crimes. So whether it's the amount of the macro amount of crimes and how many of them are hate crimes. I'm actually not certain if we have that data, but I, I do know we have pretty high. Yeah, certainly, but we <laughs> do have a full breakdown, even though there's always underreporting and certain states even report, no, we didn't have any hate crimes this year, which of course we know isn't true. Right. But we have more and more and better and better data about uh, you know, who are the targets of hate crimes, you know, why were why was it committed, where, what was the crime? And that's on the FBI's website. And actually today, our regional director um, in Atlanta, who's also the vice president of our Southern division is at the Capitol for a hate crimes law that wow. hopefully will be passed in Georgia, which had been sort of stalled. And then in light of the murder of Ahmaud Arbery did get you know more um, uh, visibility. visibility, motivation yeah. to push this, the, the legislative session is coming to an end. And so the hope is that we can have a comprehensive hate crimes law in Georgia because ADL did draft the original model as legislation for hate crimes at the state and federal level. Um, and we deem 45 states having hate crimes laws. Some are better than others, but our criteria of hate crimes laws is, is the baseline that it has to cover certain kinds of behavior uh, certain kinds of protected characteristics. And there are five states missing and Georgia is one of them. And we're wow. hoping today, or, you know, at least in the coming days, but I think today that that could change. Yeah. So uh, we're in, in a moment, I'm going to go to one question, but um, uh, in a moment, we're going to switch over to um, just the state of affairs today um, between the pandemic and everything with the black lives um, matter um, movement. Rabbi Geller had an interesting question um, and I, I don't know the answer. She's, um, this was about technology. She said, not everyone has access to technology. What does or could ADL do to make technology and internet access available to underprivileged populations? Also, how should training be made available to those people often older who are not digital natives and are intimidated by technology? During the shelter at home environment, I have seen how life saving virtual connections are. And it, I would say, you know, ADL isn't the, um, the, the people on the ground going to people's houses, making sure technology happens. But I think that we're going to start to see that people who had access to technology during this time um, are, are having very different lives than obviously than those who couldn't go anywhere, can't afford cable, can't afford internet, um, things like that. So, um, is yeah, there well, any crossover with ADL there? Well, I would say like certainly from a mission perspective, justice and fair treatment um, 
it doesn't, you know, of course there's a huge gap of, we'll just talk about America, people of course across the, country, uh, across the globe, but of people, communities that don't have regular, strong, good access to the internet, absolutely. And then beyond the internet to updates and technology and beyond that to certain um, devices and applications. So there is absolutely a gap there. Um, and it's in, in that way, it's absolutely an ADL issue. Our expertise and our bandwidth and our ability is really in being in coalition with folks that are on the ground for, um, for digital access rights. And so it's something that we are paying attention to. We're not, I'm going to confidently say we're not leaders, but we're supporters in that space right. um, because it all intersects. And I think the same thing with access um, for older generation folks, non-digital natives and their comfort with the online, with online spaces. Non-digital non um, natives, for, that's a term. Not, it, not well, digital, digital, natives. digital natives is a term, right? So in the negative. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of digital natives, but well, I assume I'm one. <laughs> no, we're actually not. Digital oh. natives are, it's mostly Gen Z. It's who was born. Um, I think it's, I guess it's maybe after 1996, after like broad swaths of the country. Got so it. I think it actually okay. aligns directly with Gen Z. Okay. All that to say, um, <laughs> access and training. So access and training we could or would do across the board. I think for us regarding access, it would definitely be more at the institutional level. How can we you know, push the importance of the institution serving communities to consider that absolutely a dedicated civil right? Um, but there's a lot of people doing good work in that space and we definitely support them in coalition for sure. It's a huge issue. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, there is a question when hate crime occurs offline. I can, I think I can answer this one. So that we'll move on. But um, and is in the news. Does ADL contact the victim or the institution, even if they may not have contacted ADL? Actually, I don't have the answer. I can. I, I do want to make it clear though that if something happens to you or to someone you love, or if you see something, if you see something, say something. Even if, if you would like, you can email me, you can email anyone at ADL, you can email Lauren, um, but also you can email me if you're, you know, if you, or you can text me and say, this is what happened, what do I do? And I know who to call at ADL to say, how do we put this into motion? And unfortunately, this has happened way too many times where I have to call, um, you know, uh, people at ADL in LA and say, this happened, did you know? Um, and some things they have known. Um, you might recall last year, was this in November? I'm trying to remember when um, there was a huge thing where they took over like Jewish names on Twitter. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Our friend, Josh Goldberg, very Jewish name. And they, um, they uh, cloned his account and started putting stuff up about can't even remember if it was about Israel, whatever it was, it was, it, we went to ADL and ADL um, was, was on it. So, um, but the question is, does ADL ever contact a victim or an institution, even if they weren't contact, if they didn't reach out in the first place? So the answer is sometimes. Um, I think that is, it's a, it's a del, it's a delicate dance. I would say, you know, some people consider themselves victims, some people consider themselves targets, some people want to get on with their lives, some people will respond in the news, some people didn't consent to the news covering their specific incident. And so not only is it like, you know, what is ADL's role, but also how can we be cognizant that somebody who's experienced a hate crime online or offline, and we also deal with maybe non-hate crime, but crime that are bias motivated or incidents that are bias motivated all the time. Um, but, you know, Here's the thing. I think we definitely have a lot of people reaching out to us. You can go to ADL.org, report an incident, and it can take you to, you know, to your locale or, or just go to our general systems. And then we can, based on like your zip code, we can direct you to the right region. Um, and sometimes we will reach out if it makes sense or if we know someone else has covered, you know, something. But we don't actively track down incidents um, for on or offline hate crimes for a couple of reasons. One, oof, there are too many. And that's just so sad, but true. Yeah. Two, again, I think being cognizant of like, what's our role and how can we best serve and help? And then three, um, you know, it's, 
what's our role from a, you know, action items perspective? Like, you know, what is ADL uniquely positioned to do in this situation? And then also what's our role from a, from a respect perspective? I think something we can talk about later is like, sometimes people don't want the ADL to contact them to, you know, maybe that's not the method that they want to move forward with this specific situation. So it's case by case. Um, yeah. It's something more, infor you know, information is power. And the more that we have information, the more we can develop our, you know, our advocacy initiatives, serve the community, track it, you know, track things. Um, but I would say it's not like an active part of our day to day. Now our center on extremism does do that more when there is an extremist or an explicit white supremacist angle to something. And that would be different. So our yeah. center on extremism, you know, a team that I work with often, but that I'm not on does do active tracking and analyzing in that way. Um, yeah, and I do want to say to everybody who's watching or will be watching later, um, I, I would be more than happy to organize a, uh, like a dinner, an evening, a tea, uh, whatever you want to call it with Lauren or with, um, Joanna, what's Joanna's last name? Oh my gosh. Mendelsohn. Just, or, and yeah, Amanda, yeah, yeah. yeah. From, um, ADL in Los Angeles. She really is like kind of like lead investigator is kind of how you could say for ADL. Is that the best way to describe her, her title? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, she's the, she's the associate director of the center on extremism. So she is a perfect person. I am thrilled to get back to, to LA. To yeah. yeah. And, and um, people should know that ADL is like the number one non um, governmental agency to literally be a part of training officers. And, and that's what we're going to get to in a second, which is inherent biases and bias in general. Um, one, Marta has a question, which was following up on Rabbi Geller's question, does ADL have staff who actively engages with the elderly population? It's interesting that this, this is not something we would have guessed with, yeah. to talk about, but. Uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, active engagement is definitely a region by region basis, but I would say like, you know, it's more so I guess, you know, what is, what is your definition of that? Like our ADL leaders who are part of what they would consider the elder, elderly uh, population mm -hmm. are absolutely, you know, you know, actively engaged with ADL. Um, so we don't have like a dedicated center on, you know, age related crime. We definitely look at that and, and consider that. We also have our own constituency, which generally does skew to our more vintage generations. Um, but, but no, I would, I, I'm not certain, um, but I'm, uh, but I'm thinking now. Right. Um, yeah, I, I do have to say I've been lucky enough to serve on the regional board and um, ADL does a really, really good job of engaging young professionals. Um, and when I say young professionals, not, not that there's anything against 20 year olds, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about glass class are people in their typically people in their thirties and forties. So I'm um, not, we're not talking about um, kind of like the Hillel crowd. Um, we're talking about people who have already in for, mo for the most part chosen careers, or maybe they're getting their PhD or maybe they're a lawyer, you know, things like that. So that um, we, I think we are people that can really um, go out and help. There are people that are trained to go be speakers. Um, but ADL, the, uh, so much of what ADL does is around um, legislation and around like really the inner workings of making our judicial system a more fair place. Um, that being said, one of the things that Lauren and I talked about was how can we get around the fact that we are two people who have some of the most blessed lives that, that you could ask for. We grew up in um, wonderful families with two working parents, um, really with everything we, that we could ask for. Um, and we can only say thank you to our parents. I can tell you like my dad and, and mom both came from nothing. Um, and so uh, the life that they were able to build for me um, I, I, I feel very blessed and I don't take for granted. Um, and yet here we're standing here today as um, leaders in nonprofit Jewish um, institutions. And we can't avoid the fact that we got here today also based on the privileged lives that we had in the first place. Um, and how do we begin the conversation about what is going on today um, with the Black Lives Matter movement 
um, without, while, while also integrating the reality of the privileged lives that we have had. And so I really want to preface this conversation that we're about to now have with a real recognition that we can only speak about this um, from the, um, because we've spent a lot of time listening to other people. So um, Lauren, in the age of the pandemic, in the age of George Floyd's death and Ahmed Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why is this the moment that I two two things and we'll talk about biases, but um why why was this the perfect storm, the pandemic? And uh like why why does it seem like now is the time that um maybe we're making some progress and a lot of it's scary and we're making a lot of progress. <laughs> what a question. Um, you know, I think that this is a time where our country is really reckoning with uh, systemic racism. And, and why is this the perfect storm? I could opine personally on what I think. I would definitely defer to experts and PhDs on like, really, what is the confluence that, that allowed it? But I think that you touched on something that I want to focus on, which is the moment versus the movement and this is a moment and this is a moment for a lot of um and 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 i'm speaking about myself because i think when you talk about race you have to talk about uh the individual and the micro and the macro and i am a white jewish female cisgender privileged lawyer so all of those intersecting identities absolutely put a picture to my perspective on this moment and also on the racial justice movement. So just sort of level setting, like I'm talking as a, and if we're gonna talk about racial justice, I'm talking as a white person. Right. Now I know that the Jewish community is multiracial and we have BIPOC, you know, black, indigenous, people of color individuals that are a part of the community. Um, and I know that terminology and vocabulary can be a lot, but I think that it, it really provides a more accurate picture to some of the things that we're talking about. So as a white person talking about racial justice, I think this is a moment. And yet I don't think that gives credence to the movement, the lifetime, the centuries, right? 400 of, years. Yeah, 400 years, 401 years. The century, the centuries of... Um, of movements and of racial justice work and of critical race theory studies and of legislation. So this to me is, is one moment in, in, a, in many and also um, really hopefully not a moment, but another um, upswing in the movement for racial justice. Um, and why? I mean, there's so many, you know, you could think, you know, again, from my, from my little place where I sit, you can think about um, that perfect storm of people being inside, people learning more through technology, us getting to a certain space. We could talk about generations and, um, and how millennials. The, the pandemic, you know, really towards the beginning, it was becoming clear that the pandemic, the coronavirus was um, hitting people of color um, at, at a much higher rate um, than, than yeah, actually, ADL in in coalition with the National Urban League and um, and Unidos put out a an op ed in Newsweek, and I can send that. Or we can, if, I don't know if you do like show notes, but I can send that around uh, about the the inequities for the coronavirus pandemic and and who was being most impacted. And also, this is turning into a recession, and who's that mostly impacting? So I think you're absolutely right. Like our our the the pandemic really highlighted what we knew all along in that our systems are, are really inequitable um, and unjust. And so, yes, all of that leading up to then this, this series of brutal murders and lynchings um, and, and the way that our systems and our institutions sort of have upheld the ability for that to happen, I think is. Yeah, um, I'm realizing we have like only 18 minutes. So um, 
Lauren and I spent a long time talking last night to figure out, you know, really what the most important things are. So some of these things we're going to move through quickly. Um, but I think this is just the beginning of a conversation. Lauren's going to be back in LA and um, back at our Temple Emanuel community, which is very special. And so I, I really hope this is the beginning um, of, of an amazing partnership or continued partnership with ADL. Um, also, Rabbi Bassin, who we're blessed to have and who's doing very well, if anybody would like to know. Um, Yay! She, uh, with little Ronan. Um, we have a name. Yeah, know. Ronan Wiley. <laughs> Ronan Wiley or Ronan Ayal. Um, anyway, she started, uh, you know, we were, I think we're blessed that, that this is not, this might be very, um, Black Lives Matter might, have, it might be in the spotlight right now, but Black Lives Matter is a international organization with over 40 region, regions. And um, th this is not a new issue as, as, as I just want to point out. We started the Jews of Color, Color task force um, last fall and the concept of white fragility, which um, is a, also the name of a book that we want everyone to read, um, was the uh, set as the Yom Kippur forum um, topic more than six months ago, actually. Um, Rabbi Bassin started planning the Yom Kippur forum for this September, or it's almost October. Um, so there's a couple things that we're going to explore right now. I'm just going to lay them out there and then we'll see how much we can fit. Number one, a lot of people are talking about what does it mean to be an anti-racist right now? How can you actively be anti-racist? Number two, you know, they say the first step is admitting the problem. I would say the first step is admitting your inherent biases and your privilege. So um, that's another thing. Um, and then the last thing that I really want to talk about is what you mentioned as competing truths. Um, I think that is something that hit, has hit our community the most right now, which is um, many of our congregants' um, stores were looted, their houses were very close to the area of the tear gas and a lot of the more violent protests and violent rioting. Um, and we did have many um, congregants who said, I, I'm allowed, you know, I'm just putting it in quotes, I'm allowed to be upset, which absolutely you are, because, but the answer kept going back to the Holocaust. So I'm going to give you the opportunity, Lauren, to explore, explore these three things for us. So that is, what does it mean to be an anti-racist and the concept of inherent biases and competing truths? I know that's a lot, but <laughs> no, this is great. So yeah. we were, we were talking about this last night and I'll have you, you know, remind me what to, yeah. when I, when I go in one direction or another, but I actually pulled up a definition of anti-racism that I really like. So I'm actually going to read it. Okay. Um, I think getting, so anti-racism is the active process of identifying and eliminating racism by changing systems, organizational structures, policies, and practices and attitudes so that the power is redistributed and shared equitability. So the attitude so, is the personal side. Attitude is personal. So I think when we talk about uh, racism, we, we know that it is individual, it's institutional, it's, it's systems-based, it's, it's a really dynamic social construct that like embeds in every piece of our lives. And so understanding that the micro and the macro, I think is really important and how to be an anti-racist is, is really different for different people. And again, I just want to go back to the fact that I am talking as, you know, a white person to what, what might, what very well might be a majority white privileged audience. Um, but I also want to recognize that but there not. are, we have a multiracial, we have a multiracial Jewish community. We have a multiracial temple. We have a multiracial city, if we're talking about the city of Beverly Hills. So, you know, I'm gonna just talk about being an anti-racist um, from, from this one perspective in recognition that this is an incomplete and imperfect perspective. Um, and so I just wanted to like give space for that. Um, yeah. But I think for, from, you know, as, as somebody who is white and who comes from a really privileged environment, being anti-racist is, is actively doing the work to understand racism and to reconcile with it, you know, as, as, a, as a daily practice um, to 
acknowledge that you are, you know, as a white person, as a privileged white person, I'm a lifelong student in being anti-racist because I have been so socialized that I have to sort of challenge myself all the time to understand the way that my impact has a greater impact on the world, but also really on the black community and on all communities on the systems of oppression that aren't white. And so I'll, the last thing I'll say is being anti-racist from that narrow, really small perspective is also building tolerance for learning and feedback. Because we have to constantly learn if we're students to grow and to be constantly growing, uh, we're, that means we have to put ourselves out there and be vulnerable and, get, and that means we will get it wrong. And so to build the tolerance to keep learning and keep learning and be curious and be respectful and also get tough feedback. And instead of being defensive, instead of shuddering or crying or feeling guilty, instead holding the space for the rage, the grief, the anger, the distress that other people might have when they, when, when they give feedback to me, I have to just sit with that and learn and do better and really do better. Not say I'm going to do better. Don't be, you know, some people take issue with, but I think that the term performative allyship or like, you know, performative work is, you know, what are we doing on our, for like Instagram on our screens or outward, but, but what are we doing internally? Yeah. Um, so, so, so that would be, I think that's the anti-racism piece I'll start with for now. And really I, th I think you can't hide behind. I mean, I, I think our, the majority, although Lauren would push me on this, I think I would like to think that the majority of our active community, um, I say active because I don't know what people who are not showing up to Temple, but you know, that, that they are a little bit aware, right, of their tendencies towards racism or being able, you know, knowing that it's not okay to say, well, I have a black friend, right? Like that's like the oldest line in the book, right? Oh, well, I love, you know, that those are not, that we are so much more, um, deep into this issue of racism that I hope that nobody would use that reaction of like, well, I'm not racist because I have this or I have that or right. I love this author. Or, I love, I mean, it's going to sound ridiculous. I love Oprah, right? Like, no, right. this is like, right. how, how do you dig deep down inside and say, this is the, this is the um, situation that I was brought up in. Right. Well, how did the TV that I watched, how did right. the, I was yeah. going to say, I, I would, I actually don't, I mean, and this is my own personal opinion, but I would actually say it's not the deep convictions. It's actually the top level day in and day out. And also recognizing that like, even if you're an activist and you are a white person, when you go home, like everything in the world is set up so that you don't have to then go think about your race because whiteness is seen incorrectly as neutral, right? And I'm, again, I'm talking about myself as, as cause I can't really talk for other people. It's such a dynamic space. Well, um, it was, but, I don't so know. it's really, yeah, but it just, the deep, I think the deep rooted feelings and convictions are there. I think when you try to dismantle systemic and institutional racism, which is really the reckoning that we're, you know, yeah. we're having, it's actually the everyday, all the little things. What does my workforce look like? What are the leadership? Why, you know, do I think that terminology is important or do I think people are sensitive? Do I think that racism is a Jewish issue or not? Like all of just, and, and sometimes the answer is yes. And then you go, okay, but why? And so it's that constant, you know, who, who are my circle of friends? What are the books I buy? Do I look at the books I buy? Where do I go to eat? So it's, yeah. it's just how do every part of our systems as opposed to the deep conviction, it's the, it's the day in and day out. And I think that's sort of the anti-racism stuff that at least I personally am really being critical with myself about. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, two, there were two things that came to my mind as you said this. One is my, my favorite composer, Jason Robert Brown, who actually I could tie this together with ADL because um, Jason Robert Brown wrote Parade in 1999. It won the Tony for Best Music. And it was about, um, oh my gosh, now I'm going to forget his name the man in the South who was Jewish man who was accused oh, of um, Leo. 
Leo Frank, sorry, Leo Frank. And actually it was after Leo Frank's, uh, Leo Frank was a man working in a factory who was accused of murdering a young woman, a young girl actually, when they were like, we always blame the black guy. So now we're gonna blame the, the Jewish guy. People will believe it if we blame the Jewish guy. And actually ADL was founded after this event. But the point about that being is that Jason Robert Brown put up a post or, or his wife, Georgia, the other day, put up a post saying exactly, what does your kid's school look like? What does your dinner table look like? What does your church look like, right? So, you know, active integration happens by personal choices that we make, um, which is, I think that is a very difficult part for me, right? Is I said to Lauren last night, there's uh, a Pew study that I believe it's something like around 20% of all Jews are BIPOC. So black indigenous people of color does that is that represented in your synagogue and if it's not are you doing everything to be welcoming to people of all colors and people of all backgrounds um, and i would almost push to say what does it mean to be welcoming does that mean that we have to wait for people to come join us or are we sort of like actively being in a community so it's just it's all those i think it's the curiosity that at least for me um is a real tool to just like continue learning, continue growth, yeah. continue being a student. And then again, you're gonna mess up. And there were, we, I, we always talk in ADL about today, like oopses and ouches, right? And like, that's so simple, but our, you know, it's one of the best tools of like, oh shoot, that that's, I, I said that, or I did that. And I'm, and you don't have to feel guilty because that's not productive, but you yeah, do you have can't to sort learn of- learn unless you, I mean, sometimes, you, that but, concept of loud and proud is really important because you can't have like a Lauren be able to be like, Lizzie, just like checking you I'm like that, think, yeah. that wasn't the right thing to say. <laughs> and, and you're not always going to get it with empathy. And that's okay too. I think that's the other thing is sometimes people will be like, hey, little nudge. Uh, and sometimes people will be really upset and, and, and hold hurt because it's really harmful words, microaggressions, even worse than microaggressions, racist statements and behaviors. Because even if we are you know, we would not, I, I can make racist statements. That doesn't mean that I am a racist person or that, you know, it, it, it's, we mess up and we have to do better and we're really socialized and I take full responsibility. And also I understand the orientation of, you know, intent. Yeah. But, but I know that my intent and my impact are different. And I know that I have to focus on how, regardless of my good intent, that's, that doesn't matter. It's really what is the impact on someone else, so. Marta said, in theory, at least when we know better, we do better. And um, Marta, that is um, really important. I have to say, Marta was part of a, <laughs> I think there might've been 150 comments on a Facebook post that she did about uh, how sad it was. I think it was something that the president said, but it was not a very, in my mind, controversial post and it, turned into one of the most, uh, there was a lot of ugly words. There were a lot of amazing people fighting for um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, okay, I, there's so much we could say and we might have to do a part two later in the summer, but sure. let's get to one thing that I know I really wanna talk about for the last five minutes, which is the competing truths. Yeah. Which is we are Jews. This is the plight that we've been through. We lost 6 million people. And yet, this is not our time to talk about our plights. And it doesn't matter, you know, I, I wanna get, let's, let's hear what you have to say. And also has ADL had anything in, to say in response to that? So I'll talk about me instead. We only have four minutes and, yeah. and you know, I'll talk in my own personal capacity, knowing my, um, where I'm coming from, where I'm sitting and what I'm saying. But I think the whole like competing truths it's, it's Elul the Elul, right? Is it the Hebrew word? That is totally one of my guiding principles. It has been since I've grown up. You talked earlier about privilege and what that means, whiteness and what that means. Um, so to me, holding competing truths and allowing two things to be true at the same time has really, um, it's, it's helped me be a student. It's helped me feel authentic, even if things feel contradictory. Great, it's both, it's both and. Um, and so, yeah, there's, I think the, to be honest, I think the competing truth of, you know, the Holocaust and the plight of Jewish people 
and the Black Lives Matter movement right now and, and, and what's our orientation in the space and all that. I actually feel like you, you know, I, I, would, I would be more interested to sort of like hear your thoughts and take um, but what I will say is um, just like a, a quick note is that, again, and this is my work in being actively anti-racist, like that's not even considering the erasure of the Jews of color who are or not even the Jews of color because that's an umbrella term, but the black Jews who are really experiencing both of this simultaneously right now. So it's, it's, um, it is, that's another, that's another piece to the puzzle of this like really big picture. But yeah, I think the competing truths is, um, how are we taking up space and when and why? I think like we are, you know, as, as a Jewish people based on the plight from thousands of years and also more recently from the Holocaust, like we're, we know hate, we know what hate looks like. We know how it manifests. We know that it manifests quietly and also loudly. We know it manifests implicitly and also explicitly. Um, and so we're commanded to speak up in the face of injustice. That is a commandment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we can hold, whether it's, you know, whether it's something Holocaust specifically related and, and family and family history, whether it's feeling vulnerable because our spaces, even though they're just property and they're not, you know, lives have been, um, you know, tarnished in some way, but also being curious about, you know, well, how or why or who and, and, and not really putting blame, but, you know, feeling vulnerable for that. And then really also just showing up for, for a people who have also experienced injustice to the greatest core, America's original sin. I mean, Jim Crow, redlining, healthcare, every system, I mean, injustice in every way and every day and every space. And so I think it's really like holding space and knowing that, you know, we can have the competing truths of curiosity and questioning and feeling um, like we've been a victim or we've been a target um, and also recognizing it's our duty to have empathy and to stand up, speak out for injustice um, and to, you know, be, like understand our, our pain and our orientation, or, you know, and our pain in its orientation to now and always. And so yeah. I don't know, it's just, it's, it's yeah. both. I think that, that I want, I want to get a shirt made that says like, yes, dot, dot, dot. And yeah, right. Sure. Meaning like, like, yes, it is horrible that your store was looted. Horrible. I will not condone it. And Let's look back 400 years and see what has been happening and see what has um, created systematic racism. What has, okay. yeah, go ahead. And can we also flip them, right? It's like, it is so horrible that our systems make it right. okay for 120 black people to have been murdered since George Floyd, 120. Yeah. And, and, wow. and it's really hard that your store or your community has been looted in some way. So can say we that again, 120 black men have been black people, murdered, black people. people have been okay. murdered since the death of, of George Floyd. And we've maybe been killed, heard about, been killed, right? Murder maybe is a legal term, but, okay. and so it's like, can we flip them? And I'm going to get all this wrong. And if somebody watched something that I, you know, something and said, ah, Lauren could have said that better. Or like, you know, Lauren only touched on that. I'm here to listen. And that's, yeah. that's, it's not okay, but I can own that. Um, so yeah, can we flip them? And can we have the yes and, but can we have that in orientation to time and, and where we are in this, in this movement, in this moment? Yeah, so, so, so yes and, and flipping the conversation. I mean, everyone has seen the memes about uh, the looting versus the, the, the deaths. And, and I think that's really important. I just have to say that uh, speaking of media, I just, on all of, I have three devices sitting in front of me and there's some CNN, something just announced that Trump, did you get that that alert? Did everybody, wait, the, about, uh, Facebook to, is now taking down all of the, uh, now I can't find it. It was oh no, it. We'll, we'll have to, yeah. I took down we'll all of the it. ads for the Trump um, well, uh, 
I know a couple of days ago, Facebook is now letting users not look at political ads, but I'll have to, if there's a, if there was a news briefing, I'll have to look right now. So um, yeah. I think it'll be interesting to do another, um, think about it Thursday soon. Uh, amazing interview part two. Yes, we will definitely do a part two if Lauren agrees to it. Um, yeah. I would love to collect because I often do facts on think about it Thursday, but there was just way too much stuff to talk about today, but I would love to collect the statistics of um, some of these things. And I know ADL is the, the, the queen of statistics. Yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, but I want to say thank you. Um, you keep me checked. I, um, I will, I will, you know what I mean by that? I, I think yeah, there's a better, for sure. and you keep me in line. Um, I also, we talked a lot about how do we talk to our community about these issues without alienating people because everybody is on this journey and not everybody is comfortable and not everybody is prepared. And the only thing that I would ask of my congregants, my main audience is to start to do the work. I mean, just get started. So yeah, we can give out some recommendations for great books. You mentioned white fragility for, for parents or families. There's raising white kids. There's, you know, amazing books like how to be an anti-racist and between the world and me. I mean, it's like the resources are out there, but yeah, just get started. Just anything, Google news, whatever it is, but uh, we're, we're here for you. I, yeah, Lizzie, I, I think like, I always call it like accountability partners, right? Can we be, can we hold yeah. people accountable? So. Yeah. Rabbi Bassin, if you're watching, I think we, I think some accountability partners would be a great part of our Jews of color task force. And uh, that would be a great program. Uh, see, look, we came up with something new. Um, Lauren Croft, thank you so much. We can't wait to have you back in LA working for um, ADL, Rabbi Geller, thank you. She says, thanks for the conversation. You both make me proud. We, uh, you had a big effect on both of our lives and um, no we're question, really happy sure. to watch the entire time. And uh, yes, Danielle, account accountability buddies. All right, Danielle's gonna start on the uh, t-shirt. We've trademarked it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and the head's gonna be like, hashtag check yourself. Yeah, love it. All right. So much love to everybody. Lauren, thank you so much for giving us your time. And we can't wait to do part two soon. So everyone be on the lookout. Bye, guys.